<laughs> Greetings, YouTube. All right, we're going to do uh, chapter 13 in Prison Affairs. We're reading chapter 13, and it's called Women of PTO. When Christ comes to reign as king on his glorious throne, he will say to the sheep on his right hand, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. Oh, I got the light on, and it makes me look like I'm telling a ghost story. <laughs> Okay, let's try to <laughs> let's try to correct that. No, that makes it even worse. Oh, but I gotta see. I don't want to put on my glasses. Dang. Let's try. Let's try. Let's try this. How about that? How about that? <laughs> I look like a ghost. Let me put it down here. How about that? Okay. <laughs> oh, I cracked myself up. Okay, let's start again. Chapter 13. Women of PTO. When Christ comes to reign as king on his glorious throne, he will say to the sheep on his right hand, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, I tell you the truth, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. That's Matthew 25, 34 and 40. Okay. When I read this scripture, I think about, when I read this scripture, I think about the women of PTO being on the right hand of God. The time and money I spend and have spent on my pen pals pale in comparison to what some of the other ladies were doing for their significant other. Moreover, these women did not seem to be lonely or desperate, as I have heard people say. Women of all races, sizes, and ages said they were supporting and faithfully waiting on an incarcerated loved one. The only difference I could find between the biblical scripture and these women was the fact that the Bible speaks of acts done without expecting, without expecting an earthly reward. That was not the case with the women of PTO. We had high hopes, plans, and dreams of what the future held once our men were released. All the letters, money, visits, clothes, jewelry, etc., were investments on what would hopefully follow in the future. Since these women and I were posting daily on PTO, we began to learn each other's personalities. A post consists of comments made by one person in reference to something another person has written. And I learned a lot by reading these posts. The various views and opinions astonished me. I could not believe some of the things I was reading. However, it was good to view matters from a different perspective. Consequently, I developed lasting friendships with a few of these women I had never met. We exchanged phone numbers and began talking by phone. When I found out some of the ladies were African American, I was ecstatic. There were other black women doing this shit. The camaraderie we shared was gratifying and enlightening. It was good to talk to people who did not judge me for being a woman in waiting. These women know the joys and pains of loving an inmate. We encouraged each other daily, waiting for that great day, the day our man comes home. 
even if your man was serving life without parole, LOP. There was a support form for your situation. The tie that Bound was having an incarcerated loved one. There were forms for husbands, wives, gays, lesbians, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers. All were welcome as long as you were supportive. Overall, the women of PTO were in full support of my new relationship. I am sure some wanted to shake some sense into me, but this was a support group, gosh darn it. You either support what is going on or get off the site. A few members of PTO said I often went too far with the posts I made. Not being able to call a spade a spade upset me to the point where as I had no desire to post for a while. However, some of the ladies value or enjoy reading what I wrote. As a result, I began posting daily once again. My online friends will argue, I am wise, I am a wise soul. I was just keeping it real. I give God the glory for whatever I wrote, if it helps someone. Allow me to introduce you to a few women from PTO who have become near and dear to my heart. They each have an interesting story to tell. Not a day goes by whereas someone is not involved in some type of dramatic situation. For the most part, members try to make the best of come what may by being supportive rather than judgmental. The first one is Micah. Micah, a 26-year-old African-American, is beautiful on the inside as well as the outside. Her spirituality and outward appearance is desirable. She writes, I met my husband Boaz when I was in the sixth grade. I made it a point to get to know him. We hit it off right away becoming very good friends. When he came to my house, we would laugh and giggle like two kids in the sand lot at school. We kicked it for a few months, then he moved to another school and we lost touch. When I was 16 years old, his sister came through the drive through where I worked and told me he had gone to prison. I quickly wrote down my address for her to give to him. The next week I got a letter from him and the rest is history. I have been with him on and off since. Our road has not been a smooth one, but no matter where I go in life, I always find myself mentally and emotionally with my Boaz. He has always had a special place in my heart, and I could never leave him out of my life. After a few years ago, we realized the feelings we had for each other and the special bond we share. We made it official and decided to marry last year. Now we are united in the flesh as one. No bars, no distance, no nothing can ever keep us apart. We dedicate our marriage to our one and only Savior and know that as long as we honor him, we will survive the storm. He will come out from among them, through those steel doors, and walk on dry land into the arms of his wife. We plan to have five children, finish college, and believe God to bless us with the business. At the present, we are working on an appeal. His projected release date is 2014. The next is Katrina Price. Katrina Price is a 22-year-old African-American college student from Maryland. She is waiting five years for her 23-year-old sweetie, Damon. I met Damon as a pen pal through my brother's friend. I decided to write him because I felt he could use someone to talk to, hold him down with things on the outside, and wanted him to have a friend. We hit it off right from the start. It was as if we had known each other for years. After a few months, I began visiting him and our relationship developed into something special. I know he loves me. I love him and what we have is real. I wait because I am very much in love. Damon is a young man who simply made some wrong decisions. His involvement in a liquor store robbery is now costing him years of his life. At the present, he has served two years of his five-year sentence. His projected release date is May 2008. Every day he is changing and professing his desire to make something of himself. I am trying to make something of myself as well by attending college to become a nurse. When it comes to the future, 
I believe God and pray Damon and I will be together for the rest of our lives. Once he is released, we have plans to marry and start a family. The next is Esperanza. Esperanza, a 21-year-old Hispanic woman born and raised in Rio Grande City, Texas, is no longer a woman in waiting. She works at a local public school and attends the University of Pan American in Edinburgh, Texas. Edinburgh, Texas. First and foremost, my relationship to the prison system extends far back to my early childhood. Ever since I can remember, and perhaps even before then, my father has been in and out of prison for numerous offenses. Some of these offenses include aggravated robbery and armed robbery. All my life, I wondered and tried more than anything to understand why my father kept being a repeat offender. Observing my father's criminal behavior led me to believe prison does not re rehabilitate or reform. Secondly, my best friend is also incarcerated. He was given 12 years for a series of multiple charges, but had no prior history as a criminal. I can remember how cheerful and happy he was when we were in high school. He was the kind of person who offered great advice and got along with everyone. Unfortunately, the change in his personality, mental and emotional state is simply incredible and beyond recognition. Much to no surprise, at least not a surprise to me, since he has been in prison, he has gotten into trouble. He is also under the care of a psychiatrist. Lastly, my ex-boyfriend is serving a five-year sentence for an aggravated charge. If you wonder why I waited and stayed with a criminal, it was because I realized these criminals are human beings who have feelings just like you and me. Before they took a wrong turn, they also had a life like you and me. More importantly, love fueled my desire to wait. This immense, wonderful feeling makes a person do crazy things and sometimes it makes a person blind. Rick was the most important person in my life and I would have given anything to be with him. I, just, I betrayed my family by going against their wishes when they asked me to leave him. According to them, he would never amount to anything. They were convinced he would never change. I was not. I stayed by his side through thick and thin and gave our relationship everything I could for two years. Unfortunately, he became so involved with the prison gangs that they became his top priority. This is when our relationship took a turn for the worse. It got to the point where we were no longer communicating and when we did, everything was about him, what he wanted, what he needed. No matter how much I loved him, I could no longer stay. Clearly, he was hurting himself and me. I felt he was disrespecting me and being completely inconsiderate of my feelings. I do not blame him entirely because I know that the circumstances in which he must live by are not the best and he must do what is necessary for him. When it all breaks down, it is all about survival. If you are weak, there is no way you can survive. You have to develop a different kind of strength on lockdown. This is one of the main reasons why there is so much gang violence in prison. People literally self-destruct because the pressure is overwhelming, which is exactly what happened to my ex-boyfriend. I have endured so much in regards to the prison system, but it has made me stronger mentally and emotionally. Next is Sabrina. My sister girlfriend, Sabrina, was born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio. She will be 43 years old in May 2005, and her husband, Rodney, will turn 35. Sabrina said their astrological sign, Taurus, gives them the tenacity they possess to endure and maintain a faithful and fulfilling relationship while Rodney survives in prison. He has been incarcerated for the last 11 years, convicted of murder for the death of his sister's husband. The brother-in-law was strung out on crack cocaine and beat his wife for over 15 years. Nevertheless, Rodney's sister was the key witness at his trial. She, called, she told the court, 
Rodney did not have to shoot my husband. He was changing. Sabrina said the sister's testimony was crucial to Rodney's conviction and subsequent sentence, which was 18 to life, instead of self-defense or manslaughter. <clears throat> she writes, I met Rodney in 1988 at ITT Technical School, where we both pursued degrees in business. From the first time I looked into his eyes, I was hooked. But when I found out his age, I ran. I did not want to hear the comments my child's father would make if I were seen with a younger man. However, a year later, we hooked up. For six months, our relationship was filled with bliss, romance, and intrigue. But I was thinking it was simply a case of puppy love for Rodney and how much I could not bear being dumped by him. As a result, I faded away, even though I was hooked. Eventually, I met a nice 32-year-old Christian man who was quiet and good to and for my two children, ages 12 and 7 and I. He was a good, decent man to settle down with, and I was approaching the big 30. We married in 1992. I liked him a lot, but it was nothing like being in love with Rodney. In 1993, I believe fate was the reason the love of my life with his girlfriend and their three sons in tow, moved right next door. The home I lived in belongs to my mother, who treats Rodney like one of her sons, so we kept in contact. While I was downstairs cooking, cleaning, reading the Bible, and helping the kids with their homework, he would be in another part of the house with my mother and brother. I call him the yin to my yang, because I could smell and sense him when he was near. Being a God-fearing woman, I prayed every day for God to lift Rodney off my heart, which was heavy, and my mind. I wanted the night sweats and dreams to stop. I got more involved with the church, gardening, and the daycare center. I was moving on with my life until one fateful night in 1994. This was the night Rodney revealed his crime. As I began to cry, I reached over and hugged him. At that moment, I knew I would always love him. Four months later, the beast swallowed Rodney whole. I wrote and supported Rodney while watching the mother of his children move on with her life as if Rodney was no longer her man. I never wrote about what I saw because I did not want him to hurt anymore. Eventually, he found out. He said he was happy for his girlfriend, wished her the best, and hoped she found someone who would not mistreat his boys. To ease his pain, I continually sent scriptures from the Bible encouraging him to stay strong. He encouraged me as well. Since Rodney believes in staying married till death do us part, he tried convincing me to give my marriage a second chance. I let him know my heart was not in it and confessed to loving him more than life. I explained that he had not come into my life. I might have ended it. Had he not come into my life, I might have ended it. In 1995, I became celibate. I had no desire for sex with anyone but Rodney. My divorce became final in 1997. When I told Rodney he was the only man I would ever marry, he was flattered, but said he would not marry me while he was behind bars. However, in May 2002, we became husband and wife while he was still incarcerated. That was and still is the happiest day of my life. I would support and wait for him regardless, but would rather wait as his wife rather than his girlfriend. As much as my mother loves Rodney, she was hesitant when giving her blessing because he was in prison. My four brothers had a small tantrum, but eventually they all had to bow down because they know I am truly happy and it is because of Rodney. We are in love in spite of our predicament, and nothing but God can sway us. For the last nine and a half years, I have been dedicated to Rodney, and he has done likewise. I believe being in prison has made him grow up and mature. He is indeed a better man today than he was in 1994. All along the way, I discovered it is not easy to wait for my husband. I have been struggling with attorneys, courts, wardens, correction officers, COs, prisons, appeals, clemency, 
and life nonstop. Rodney has an indefinite sentence, albeit is scheduled to go before parole board in November 2007. This experience has taught us both to appreciate life, love, and family. Through God's grace, we will survive. This too shall pass. Next is Madison. Madison, a 28-year-old Caucasian, has two female has two children and a 14-year wait before her first love, Dylan, comes up for parole. He is serving 23 to life for murder. Even though she and I are complete opposites, I came to care for her more than any other member I had never met. What first got my attention was the fact that her man, like Tyrone, was not coming up for parole until 2019. I could relate to her on that fact alone. I met and gave my heart to Dylan. This is what Madison writes. I met and gave my heart to Dylan when I was 14 years old. I will never forget the day I saw Dylan for the first time. I could not take my eyes off him. His confidence and appearance had me hooked. I knew he was the man I wanted to marry. A friendship was established and eventually we took our relationship to the next level. Dylan was my first boyfriend, first kiss, and first love. We were inseparable. I believed everything about our relationship was perfect. However, not everything about Dylan's life was. It was not long before he was in trouble again. Eventually, he was sent to live with his uncle in the Hamptons, which was two hours away from me. I could not drive, so I was devastated. Circumstances permitting, we spent every other weekend together until he was locked up again. I saw live coverage of Dylan's arrest on the local news. Ten years passed, but I never let him go. Even though I grew up, got married, and had two beautiful children, he always held a special place in my heart. One day, while talking about soulmates with co-workers, I told my story. When I said his name, a girl I had worked with for a year said, I know Dylan. He is in Rikers. The next day, I made a few calls. The day after, I went to see him. In the beginning, it was a little weird. I still pictured him as he was when he was 15 years old, almost not recognizing him. However, 10 minutes into the visit, it was as, it was if I had never lost him. I realized all after all this time, he was still the one, was always the one, and would always be the one. After our second visit, Dylan called off his wedding, which was only two weeks away. I am now getting a divorce. My whole marriage was a lie. I was tired of living. Now I am in love for real and finally happy. I never gave my heart to my husband because Dylan still had it. He makes me happier in a short visit than anyone has ever made me. I am tired of living by a certain set of rules with everything according to how it is supposed to be. Now I am living by my own set of rules, the ones that make me happy. All my friends think I am crazy to wait years for a man in prison. I believe we are destined to be together because of the way I found him. I feel if I have to wait to be with him forever, it is worth it. Dylan is an incredible man who adores me more than life itself. I am his princess and he has promised to love me for a lifetime. The next is Rhonda. Rhonda, a 38-year-old Caucasian, met her man Thomas a year before his probation was revoked and subsequent four-year sentence. She writes, I was prepared to wait for Thomas, although I was a recovering drug addict and enough on, with enough on my plate trying to get my own life back together. Soon thereafter, Thomas decided I was not doing enough for him. I was not sending enough money, writing enough letters, or sufficiently coming to visit. So I decided to move on with my life since he obviously could not appreciate what I was doing. Later, we tried to work things out, but whatever I did was still not enough. While we were separated, I met Bryce through his sister, who was my friend. 
he was nearing the end of a two-year sentence. Once released, and after all the letters, we became involved. Things were good until a blue warrant was issued for his arrest. The parole officer issues a blue warrant when the offender is alleged to have committed a new offense, absconded from supervision, or violated any rules, terms, or conditions of his or her parole. Subsequently, he was swallowed by the beast once more. Later, I found out Bryce was involved with drugs and another woman. After he got clean and sober, he resumed writing to me. He let me know how wrong he was and apologized. He is still heavy on my heart and I now plan my life around him and his release date, which could be far off. He has two charges that carry two to 10 years and two to 20 years. We have talked about what it would be like when he gets out. And all we know for sure is that we want to be together. I let Bryce know under no uncertain terms that he will have to remain drug free or I can't be with him. Bryce admits he has a drug problem, which is the first step to recovery. So I have vowed to buckle up, hang on tight, and get ready for the longest and roughest emotional roller coaster ride of my life. Why? Because I think he's worth it. And last but not least is Gail. Gail is a 34 year old African American mother and common law wife from Dallas. Since the first time we met, I have grown to love and care for her. She is an articulate, college-educated woman who has fallen in love with what she believes to be a compassionate, loving man who just happens to be convicted of committing a crime. She said, she said he was a man waiting to be showered with love and respect so that he could make something better for himself. And because she took that chance, she found a man that would was, that was stand beside and fight for her. A man who respects, encourages, and nurtures her because she respects, encourages, and nurtures him. She writes, I used to fantasize about the man who would capture my heart and soul. You know, the man who would make me feel butterflies in my stomach when he kissed me. That knight in shining armor who would love me and protect me happily ever after with dreams of long walks on the beach and rainy afternoons making love. Fast forward to reality and there are no long walks or making love. Instead, we share a table littered with snacks from a vending machine under the ever watchful eyes of a prison guard. Yes, the man I love with all my heart and soul is a convicted felon. We squeeze a lifetime of laughter, loving, fighting, and making up in two-hour visits every other weekend and many letters. You have never had a healthy argument until you have had one through the mail. Our relationship is not easy to maintain. It requires commitment, patience, compassion, and every ounce of mental strength that I did not know I possessed. At times, I want to walk away and never look back. I want someone to warm my bed on cold nights and hold me after a stressful day. Instead, I spend my days waiting, waiting for the mail, waiting for our next visit, waiting for his release, waiting, waiting, and waiting some more. What also makes the waiting difficult is the fact that the Texas Department of Criminal Justice does not allow conjugal visits or phone calls, and there are very few programs to help the family unit stay together after incarceration. It seems as if they do everything possible to kill any healthy relationship the inmate had prior to prison. I learned quickly that in order to fight for our relationship, I could no longer hang my head in shame that my husband is incarcerated. I had to hold my head up and make TDCJ deal with me with the respect and dignity that I deserve. I could not sit quietly and allow them to treat my husband as if he were an animal. The inmate is made to feel that he is worthless as a man and a human being. 
to be stripped of your freedom and dignity is very dehumanizing, in my opinion, and not rehabilitating at all. But we will survive. All right, y'all. That is chapter 13, Women of PTO. Yes, we did it. One shot. All right. I'm going to come back with an update from chapter 1 to chapter 13 before we press on from to 14 to 26. We're going to stop right here and say smooches. Remember, hit subscribe, like, hit the bell. Peace.